Well, you, you'll also be happy to know that the average human being uh, puts out 100 watts of energy just sitting there. So there are 500 people here, so that's 50,000 watts of energy being generated by all of you, which is enough, uh, which is enough uh, energy to uh, cover the entire continent of Europe with a blasting radio signal, which we'll try to do tonight. 50,000 watts. Here's our friend, uh, the god Janus, uh, who accompanies me everywhere. He's the god of beginnings, uh, looking backwards and forwards at the same time. He gives the word January its origin. And we're at one of those uh, watersheds uh, always. You can look at any year and say, this is the end of something and the beginning of something else. A um, hundred years ago, ominously, uh, feature motion pictures began with this film. This was uh, D.W. Griffith's Birth of a Nation. Uh, it celebrated, believe it or not, the Ku Klux Klan, and it was the first mega hit. It made in today's uh, money probably over a billion dollars. Um, uh, there were films before that, not too many, but nothing had ever happened like this before, and it happened in 1915, exactly 100 years ago. Today, we're 100 years later at 2015. Uh, 1915, let's say, was the birth of film, uh, the way we understand it. 2015, we can say, is the death of film, that film itself as a substance is not completely gone, but almost completely gone. Uh, is our Films dead, motion pictures, definitely not, uh, as we can see from everything that's going on here in Amsterdam. Exactly in the middle uh, of these two dates, 1965, I began working in film. So 50 years after Birth of a Nation, I started making movies, and here we are 50 years later uh, at 2015. 65 was also the date I got married to the lovely Aggie, and we're still married 50 years later. <laughs> Aggie would have loved to be here. She was at one of the super meets and uh, gave out the raffle tickets uh, in, a, in an unduplicatable way. Uh, but she's in Argentina right now where our daughter lives, uh, about to have a baby. So she's, uh, she sends her regards to everybody. Yeah. Uh, somewhere in the middle there, this is me again. Uh, editing on film, Apocalypse Now. Uh, I was looking for what we called a smitchy, uh, which was a one or two frame clip uh, that had slipped out of the bin and was down at the bottom of the bin. And I was pulling uh, some of the 1,250,000 feet of work print out of this bin looking for these two frames which were going to make a crucial difference in some edit that I was doing. You can see the boxes up in the uh, upper right-hand corner. Each one of those contained 10 minutes of film. We lived and died by these boxes, and they too are gone. Along with this experience, uh, this is the mid-1980s. We were still working on film. This is Kerry Kohler, an assistant editor. Uh, he's reduplicating for you the moment of first blood, uh, because editing rooms in those days were bloody. Uh, you marked uh, from the start of the job how long did it take before you got wounded by some of the very sharp objects that were around you. Uh, razor blades and splicing blocks and spinning uh, toothed gears and everything else. So that's... Uh, uh, Kerry uh, experiencing the agony of physically editing film. This is Les Hodgson editing on the movie Yola, which uh, accompanied film shortly after the birth of the nation. It was uh, invented. Birth of a nation was edited without any kind of editing machine at all. It was simply by looking at f film images and uh, having gut instincts about where this might uh, cut together. Um, anyway, the movie Yola was our constant companion from the mid-1920s until roughly the mid-1990s. Uh, so that's a good 70-year span. Um, but there it is. It was a sewing machine on legs and uh, made about the same kind of racket. 
this is me uh, editing the last film I edited on film before English Patient was the film that I jumped to digital. Um, this was Jerry Zucker's film, First Night, and I was working on a chem flatbed. You can see it there. Uh, two screens, a, basically a, uh, uh, you know, a viewer and a record monitor uh, in today's terms. Um, over on the right-hand side, you can see those film storage racks. I'm, I'm cutting a scene, uh, and that's the, my, my bins uh, are uh, on the chem. Those are those rolls of film. I think that chair is still with me. Because uh, I, I was working standing up, you can see. I have the chem up on those plywood boxes. Uh, I began editing standing up uh, in the mid-1980s. Well, I, I began in the mid-1960s, and then I went into a decline uh, period when I st uh, started working uh, on flatbeds in the 70s, because then you sat at them, and I said, in the mid-80s, I said, to hell with that, I'm going to go back to standing, and I've continued to stand. There's lots to say about that. I would, in, in, uh, too many, in so many words, I would recommend it as uh, for your health and creativity to, to do it. So, despite all those changes, this is uh, another favorite quote of mine from Victor Fleming, who in 1939 uh, was nominated uh, for two films, Wizard of Oz and Gone with the Wind. Um, and it's good editing makes the film look well-directed. Great editing, whatever that is, makes the film look like it wasn't directed at all, which is a strange thing uh, when you think about it coming from a director, but it's a truth. He was getting at a thing that was true then and is true now, which is when it reaches uh, a sweet spot I editing, um, it can make the audience forget that they're watching a constructed event uh, or a con an artificially constructed thing on the screen, and it simply takes over as an experience. And in that sense, you're not aware that there is a director, certainly not aware that there is um, an editor. It's also helpful to know that when motion pictures were invented, editing did not come along with that. In fact, it's a good time to point out the fact that the word editing is, is, is a bad word. I wish uh, English used uh, the word montage, which is uh, the, the word in uh, Romance languages, French, Italian, Spanish, and it, it means to construct, to put together. So, and and it, it's in, independent of film. It just if, if you call a plumber in to build the plumbing for your house, he would montage the plumbing to stick it together, and that's, just, that's another way of looking at what we're doing. It's kind of crude, but that's what we do. We take pieces of film and we connect them up and we try to get the emotional juices flowing through them uh, in the right way without any spillage uh, and delivering the goods where they're supposed to go. But the idea of taking bits of film and putting them together in a certain order that would somehow hypnotize an audience into thinking that this is actually continuous reality, which it isn't, and that it's really happening in front of them, which it isn't, uh, was a discovery that was made about 14 years after the invention of motion pictures themselves. So from 1889 to 1903, we had mostly what you can see today on YouTube. You know, single shot movies that lasted a, a minute or so, uh, cat videos, basically. Um, and that was, you know, it's amusing today, it was amusing back then, but then somebody, and we don't really know who it was, the, the arrow is pointing at a guy in England named James Wilkerson, uh, who in 1901 began to experiment with this stuff, uh, of putting together pieces and the, the mind would somehow follow it. Um, so in uh, 1903, this idea began to take hold, and as I indicated with uh, our, our friend D.W. Griffith, by 1915, it, it had really taken hold, and the, the world that we live in as far as cinema goes, began at, at that point. That, that was the, uh, the, the, the landing uh, on earth of this new art uh, form. 
A um, couple of years ago, I was in London at the Tate Modern and uh, went to an exhibit by uh, Tacita Dean, as an artist, who was lamenting, even then, um, the, the film, although the exhibit was uh, set up as a way to celebrate film, but it, it had, if you knew how to read the, the tea leaves, it, it had another context, which is farewell film. Um, and there is the, this big monument uh, in the central turbine hall of the, um, uh, of the Tate Modern, of uh, this big sprocketed uh, thing, which the kids loved. Let's see if we can play this little movie. Anyway, goodbye, 35 millimeter. Uh, one of the things to keep in mind about 35 millimeter is that it weighed something. The rule of thumb was 11 minutes weighed 11 pounds. That works out to be a minute a pound, um, or a pound a minute. It's uh, Apocalypse Now, which uh, had 250 some hours of film works out to be 14,160 minutes, or seven tons of work print uh, scattered all over the many, many editing rooms that we had going, where there were three editors working simultaneously. There were dozens of assistants who were schlepping this stuff around and rewinding it and splicing little bits of film back into the rolls. Um, the documentary I worked on a couple of years ago, Particle Fever, uh, uh, about the Large Hadron Collider in Geneva had 32,000 minutes of film, which was 16 tons of work print. And I was the only editor. So that puts the things in context. A film like Particle Fever, with the budget it had and the schedule it had, it simply would have been impossible to do that film without going to the digital world. We, we, so digital... Uh, technology in all of its forms empowers us to make things and do things that we simply couldn't, couldn't do uh, before and, and certainly not in the way that we used to do them. I'm very happy that I lived in the period that I lived to get experience all of this. It's like the transition from uh, doing sculpture with a chisel in stone and now doing it in clay. Each of them have their virtues, but we're definitely, we've moved into this, uh, the world of, let's call it digital clay, where we can have this almost, in fact, let's say, almost, uh, uh, with a, a, a completely unrestricted malleability of the medium itself. Uh, this began, uh, my digital world began during the mixing of Apocalypse Now. This is me at the mixing board, uh, which was the first uh, uh, digitally uh, enhanced mixing board. It, it, there was a computer attached to this board that remembered the positions of the faders only. That was it. So no, nothing to do with equalization or uh, signal path or any of that stuff, which we're very used to now. But in those days, that was uh, a big uh, advantage, and we took advantage of it. Um, and then, in, a, in the blink of an eye, I turned from this person into the, this person. Uh, <laughs> this is me mixing, using uh, Pro Tools, uh, the icon board, which now itself has been superseded. Um, um, this is about five years ago, um, working on one of Francis Coppola's films. So. Uh, and this is that film. Uh, I, I was editing this in Argentina. Uh, this was my editing room. Um, I had the luxury on this, uh, which I, I hope all of you experience at one point, of having my editing room in the projection room, in a corner of the room, so that I could turn from my editing screens and simply look at a screen that was about this big. Um, you see it on the left-hand side of the screen. 
Um, so, um, you know, you, you would do something and then just turn and there it was uh, on a big screen in stereo in, in 3.1 sound is, is the environment, sonic environment that I was working in. Um, and I was using Final Cut 7 on that. And um, I continued to use Final Cut 7 until it disappeared. Um, <laughs> as Ronald Reagan said of the Democratic Party, I didn't leave the party, it left me. Uh, <laughs> Uh, something similar happened with Final Cut. Um, the contrast, this uh, space, which uh, this film was like a $3 million movie. Um, this is my space, which was considerably reduced on Tomorrowland, which was a $200 million movie. Um, this is during a shooting of, uh, in Vancouver. Uh, this is my setup. Uh, there's a plasma screen that you can't see off to the right, and I was using Avid on this. Um, I had used Avid uh, for roughly eight years, from 2005, uh, uh, 1995 to 2002. Uh, and that, uh, after that, I switched to Final Cut. Um, so I, I got back in the saddle with Avid uh, for various reasons that we can talk about again. Uh, it, it had to do with how many people there were in the editing suite? Many. Uh, it was a highly visually affected film, and so everybody had to know Avid and, or whatever system we were using, and that uh, pushed the decision uh, effortlessly toward Avid, because everybody knows in the professional world, you just have to know how to use Avid. I was happy to, to use it. I was interested in Given how many years had passed, uh, 11, 12 years since I'd last used it, how little had really changed in, in the process. Um, I was particularly frustrated with the fact that I was limited to just 25 audio tracks because I'm an audio person and I love to spread out uh, my tracks. I love to do a lot of stuff with tracks. I love uh, all the things y you can do with uh, sound. So here I am uh, now in London. Uh, you can recognize it's the same uh, setup. This, this is the editing desk, which is an architect's table that I bought uh, for English patient for $100 back from IKEA. Um, thank you, IKEA. Uh, it's held up very well, and uh, I'm very comfortable with it. I'm standing at it. There are two secrets for me to standing up. One of them is just give it a try. Uh, that little stool down there uh, is the secret. Uh, if you look behind the counter at any perfume counter uh, in a department store, you will usually see some version of that. Because for people who have to stand all day, it's very good to alternate legs uh, so that you're not standing on two feet all the time because then eventually your back caves in. So if you do that, your lower back rotates uh, outward and it saves your lower back. And the other secret um, is, it's just a wrist rest, um, but it's in a little trough there, which came with the table, and I, and I just took advantage of it. But it means that I can kind of lean up to the bar. I can lean on the table like you would lean at, at the bar at a, at a pub, um, and it's soft. And so I'm not putting all of my weight all the time on my legs. Plus, I don't stand all the time. I have an architect's chair. Uh, and especially when I'm reviewing things or looking at something that I've done, looking at dailies, uh, then I sit down. It's, it's only when I'm actually actively putting stuff together or actively unputting stuff together, doing things, that's when I'm standing. And I stand for the same reason that an orchestra conductor stands, the same reason that a cook stands, the same reason that uh, a surgeon stands. Um, all of these people stand to do what they do, and it's for a reason, because all of those uh, activities, and many more, are time-dependent. We have to get this operation done in the next two hours, and things have to happen. And under those circumstances, standing gives you a sense of time that you don't have when you're sitting down. And for editors, time, a sense of time is everything. Not every everything, but a huge portion of it. So standing makes you feel the frames, the, the, the sequence of events in a different and I think better way than sitting down. Not that 
uh, you know, I know m many wonderful editors who sit down. I sat down myself for a number of years, and I edited wonderful films sitting down, but I, I just I recommend standing. Anyway, I'm now using Premiere. So I've gone from, <laughs> yeah, from the uh, Moviola to the Chem and Steenbeck uh, flatbeds to the Avid to Final Cut, and now I'm working with uh, Premiere. And since I'm working in London, I made this red L uh, to remind myself that I'm learning. Uh, and if you walk around London, you'll see uh, people zipping by on motorbikes and cars with the red L in the, on the back of them or the window saying, this is a learning driver. So here, this is a reminder to me and to everybody that uh, I'm still learning it. I've been using Premiere now for three months and I'm having a very good time doing it. Um, I had a nice meeting with the uh, top engineers and executives at Adobe um, uh, yesterday morning, and I prepared a 12-page memo of what I call bugs and butterflies. Uh, bugs, we all know, butterflies are the opposite of bugs. They're wonderful things, and happy to celebrate them. Uh, and, yes, indeed. And, uh, and also, Wubigs, uh, WBGs, would be goods. Uh, this is really great, but it would be even better if. Da, da, da. So they're very receptive uh, to these things. I, I was having breakfast with Joel Cohen in London on Friday, and he's, he was, he's using Premiere on his new film, Hail Caesar. And uh, we were comparing notes, and he's having a good time. Um, you know, he similarly had observations about it, but the, the great news is that. Adobe listens to filmmakers and very quickly can, if, if it deems possible, to incorporate what the filmmakers are thinking uh, into the program at a, in a very rapid clip. Um, uh, at the uh, Adobe booth uh, over the last couple of days, I was demonstrating my idea, which was to have a trim on the fly feature, which uh, Avid has, Final Cut has, but Premiere did not have. And I said, you got to have it. This was back in March in San Francisco, and by May in London, it was there in, in the program. So uh, uh, I, I'm not going to go into details about it, but it's, uh, it's just it's dynamic trimming that gives you a readout of how many frames off or on or plus or minus you were at that, uh, the, last, the last time you made a cut actively as the film goes by at 24 or 25 frames a second. So, this, this is another reason I made the shift. This is the timeline from, um, uh, this is Hemingway and Gellhorn, uh, Phil Kaufman's HBO film that I did in 2011. Uh, here you're looking at uh, the Final Cut Pro 7 timeline of the entire film. I work in a single timeline, uh, not divided up into reels. We also edited the sound in a single timeline, and mixed the sound in a single timeline. And, and this was mixed at Lucasfilm uh, in uh, Nicasio, California. And it was the first time many of those uh, people there, very talented, top-of-the-line people, had worked in a single file, and they loved it uh, for various reasons. So uh, what you're looking at is, as I said, the entire film, but it's split. The equator runs through the middle. Everything north of the equator is picture. Uh, and here it's divided up into tracks because each track has uh, a clips that have to have something different done to them. This, we're just getting ready to export all of this to, uh, to go online. Uh, so that's why it's quite as exploded as, as it is. Uh, the, the top stuff, which is dark, is um, what in Premiere would be called adjustment layers. Um, we just called them back then, let me remember, they were uh, empty video tracks or something like slugs, empty slugs. Um, but they had metadata in them that we put in to say everything below this clip is something, a scene or a, uh, needs a certain kind of treatment or something. So it's a, it was a way of uh, incorporating notes about what we were doing into the material. Everything below the red line is sound, and if we do that, you get a sense of all of the tracks. So it was 50 tracks. Um, 
and I will be happy in, when I get to this point uh, on the film that I'm working now on in London. Right now, we're still at very early stages, uh, so we haven't gotten into the, any of the fancy stuff. But the top eight tracks were dialogue, and then there were two tracks of narration, then two track, uh, four tracks of mono effects, and then two tracks of mono with LFE, low frequency enhancement. I, I was working in a 3.1 environment, LCR boom, uh, or LCR LFE, uh, and then stereo effects with LFE, uh, stereo score music with LFE, and then stereo source music with LFE, and then three tracks which were LCR premixes by the sound effects editors who were cutting already as we were editing. We had exported sections of the film uh, to Lucasfilm to say, could you do some stuff here for the battle scene? And when that would come back as a, uh, a three-track LCR, I would, I would bring that in and it lived on these last three tracks down there. Uh, visually, one of the advantages of Final Cut 7 and Premiere is that you can disable tracks, you can lock them, and they turn gray like that. And there is nothing on those gray tracks. They're there only as visual separators to remind me, uh, you know, looking at 50 tracks simultaneously can give you a headache and make you very dizzy. Uh, this way, if, if I look at it, then I can see, oh yeah, that's music, oh yeah, that's source, that's score, that's mono stuff. So it, it's a neat way, very quickly, to visually um, uh, help you uh, separate out things uh, mentally uh, just by looking at it. What, what I did at, uh, uh, today at the IBC um, was talk technically uh, about editing and specifically about editing with Premiere. I touched on some of these things, um, but what I'd like to do now is shift gears a bit, uh, given the fact that I've uh, been doing this for 50 years, and talk more globally about things that are independent of whatever system you're using. And, you know, they're, they're all fine. Um, in, in the, bo the bottom line. Uh, Avid, I, you know, it's fine. Uh, it just has some restrictions that I wish weren't there. Um, I'm very interested in Premiere. I see a few issues with it, but th they are on the way to being solved. Um, Final Cut had this thing happen to it, um, and I wish it well. I, you know, I think Final Cut 10, um, you know, thanks to third-party developers, will get back uh, to something that people will feel very comfortably using professionally. Um, I'm not quite at that place yet with it. Uh, and as I said, I'm, I'm just curious about systems. I love to get try new systems because it teaches me. It's like learning a new language. You learn different ways of looking at film by the fact that the systems are slightly different. But you know, they're, they're similar in, in the same way that if you go to the airport and rent a car, it's almost doesn't matter what car you rent, you, you know how to use it. You know, it's got automatic transmission or, or semi-automatic transmission, and uh, this is the steering wheel, and this is the shifting gears, and there's the brake, and, you know, there are minor differences, but nothing compared to the way it was back in the time of uh, Birth of a Nation, where there were completely different operating systems in automobiles. There were steam cars, there were electric cars, which may be coming back. Now, there were gasoline-powered cars, and among gasoline-powered cars, there were very different ways of braking. Um, the Ford cars had a very strange way of braking, which involved the clutch. I, I don't understand it, but you, you, if you were used to one kind of car, it was very hard to make the shift to another kind of car. Uh, now that's not an issue, and that, that seems to be what's happening with editing systems. Um, let's forget about the systems themselves uh, and talk about more global issues. One of the things I'd just like to raise a flag about, uh, because there's a lot of discussion of, okay, we're leaving film behind, we're moving into the digital world, which is Great on one hand, but there are people um, 
filmmakers who say, I, I can't, I, I love the look of film. I can't leave, I have to shoot on film. And um, uh, Christopher Nolan, for, for one. Uh, and uh, for many years, uh, Steve Spielberg would only, uh, he wanted to edit on film, and so he had Michael Kahn using moviolas, uh, and he, he bought up like six moviolas uh, as the company was shutting down so that he knew that he would have moviolas to work with for the rest of his days. I think now he's made the transition. Um, so uh, we're, we're leaving film, but, and mo but most of the discussion is about the look of it, um, the grain, basically the grain structure of it. I, I think ultimately that's a non-issue, uh, uh, but okay, it's, let's say that's important. What, what is extremely important and which nobody has commented on, I, I'm speaking here uh, uh, about something that nobody talks about, which is the death not only of film but of dailies, or let's say it, the dailies experience. In the world of film, you, uh, when you shot on film, you had to, the next lunchtime or the next evening, depending on the schedule, all of the heads of departments had to come together and spend whatever it was, uh, you know, uh, anywhere from half an hour to three hours uh, watching the dailies. What did we shoot yesterday? And um, people were tired, they'd been working all day, and now I have to go to dailies, but that was what you had to do. That was simply the price of this process, and there was no way around it. Um, and that's just gone now. I, I can't remember, well, let me see. The last time I regularly screened dailies in that way with a director was Catherine Bigelow on K-19, which was 2001. So that's 14 years ago. Uh, in all the films I've done since, it, it just, it doesn't happen because during shooting, the set is filled with plasma screens and you're watching, you're seeing what the camera sees all the time. And so at the end of the day, everyone's tired and they think, I've seen it, I don't need to go look at it again. And on a certain level, they're right. You need all the energy you can have because making films is very tiring. But what's gone is this, it's an almost sacramental moment. Uh, uh, had a kind of religious overtones to it, and now we're unveiling the miracle of what we shot yesterday, and uh, you have to watch it. And sometimes it's painful because it didn't turn out the way you thought it would, or there was a bad problem, technical problem, or the acting wasn't so good, or the camera was out of focus, or, and you had to sit there and endure it uh, because there was no way around that particular rock in the road. But you learned a lot from that discipline because you were in the same room as the director and the director was in the same room as everybody else and you pick up these vibes uh, as a result um, because there is no other agenda than watching the material. When you're on set looking at what the camera sees, you see it, but your mind is schizophrenic. You're seeing that and at the same time you're thinking, um, what's the next shot going to be? Or, uh, oh yeah, I have to adjust the makeup for that shot, or you know, whatever it happens to be. There are, there are dozens of agendas going on as you watch something being shot, whereas dailies was there is no other agenda than to simply look at it. And that brought a knowledge to, the, to the, what you did the next day that I think is unduplicatable, but it is now being lost. Um, so I, I would say this is as profound a difference uh, and on a certain level more profound than any slight shift in the granular structure of what we're looking at. It, it's, a, it's a part of the process that is vanishing. Here's our friend, the black box. Um, it's... Uh, I brightened it so you can see it in this environment, but let's imagine that it's black. Um, one of the things that digital filmmaking has done is push out into the open a conflict that has always been there, 
but now it's, everyone can see it and everyone has to come to terms with it. And it's the, uh, what you get from digital material is great control and great spontaneity. The equipment is very light and very flexible and you can take a GoPro camera, as I was reading today, and take it up in a balloon to the edge of space and photograph the world. An ordinary person can do this. Uh, you just take a weather balloon, put a GoPro camera on it, let it go, and you, know, it's, you have to somehow get it back. But you can do this yourself. You can, you can photograph the world from the edge of space with a camera that costs whatever it is, a couple of hundred dollars. Um, so you can do that, and at the same time, you can, be, you can work at Pixar, where you have control over every pixel of the film. Uh, there is not a single pixel in a Pixar film that has not been uh, consciously or unconsciously blessed with the holy water of Pixar. Yes, we approve of each of you 12,000 pixels in this frame. Uh, and if I don't approve of them, I'm going to change you. Uh, and that frequently happens. So you get tremendous control and tremendous spontaneity. The black box is something that I came up with to symbolize this control. And what I'd like you to imagine is that the devil uh, appears to you one day, a uh, friendly fellow, and he says, hello, I have something here I think you'd like. What is it? It's this. And he holds out this box. And he says, um, what you can do with this is if you just attach these electrodes to this place on your head, uh, you can then, when you turn this box on, you can then think your film into the box. You just think it in. And then you s turn this switch and you can look at it. And, well, what if I don't like it? Well, then you turn this switch and you can change it. You mean I don't have to have cameras or crew or animators or... No, you just, this is it, you know, just comes right out of your head into the box. How much, says the filmmaker? Oh, a trivial amount, your eternal soul. And the filmmaker whips out the, his soul out of his back pocket and gives it to the devil and runs off and starts making films with the black box. And there are black box filmmakers. Uh, Alfred Hitchcock, I think, is the, would be the most famous black box filmmaker. He had the film in his head, and then he endured the process of shooting. He didn't enjoy it. It was all about compromise, and he would set a level. Uh, how, how, what will I accept l diminishment of what's in my head? And I don't know what it was, but it was some figure. And um, then he would get back to the editing room and start putting it uh, together. But I think if the devil had appeared to Albert Hitchcock and said, here it is, he is the kind of filmmaker who would take it. Um, it it's the, the, the prognosis for digital is more and more control. And there are simultaneous developments that are happening at universities all over the world, particularly at Duke University in the States, where this mind control of things is actually happening. Now, mind control can make things do stuff. You, by simply thinking something, you can get an object like an artificial hand to do a series of things. And it's just through thought waves. And, you know, given everything that's happened in the last 20 years, you imagine 20 years in the future, the black box is not improbable. It, it's hard to see how we get there exactly, but it, you know, it, it's a glowing thing on the horizon, just below the horizon. What's that strange glow out there? Well, it's the black box looming at us. Put in comparison with the black box is the snowflake, which is great spontaneity. The digital technology gives you the ability to make a film in a day. And there is this organization called Film in a Day, which is sort of like Iron Chef, but film, where you assemble with a bunch of other strangers to a location at six o'clock in the morning, uh, a piece of paper is handed out uh, with six things on it, and you form yourself into groups of six people, I think, crews of six, and with each of those papers, you go off and make a film in which each of those six things happens somehow. Uh, and you shoot it in the morning, you edit it in the afternoon, 
and you put music on it or whatever, sound effects, and then at 8 o'clock in the evening, you all come back to a location that's been predetermined, and you have a screening of these, whatever it is, you know, eight films that, were, that didn't exist in the morning and which now exist. It, so it's fantastically spontaneous, but what you have to sac let go of is uh, control. You cannot control the weather in that kind of environment. You can't really control who your actors will be because of unavailability. You can't really control exactly, the, obviously, the traffic in the background or the, the bird that flies past or any of these things. So they seem to be, these two things seem to be a zero-sum game. They, they may not be, but there's certainly that element, which is, yes, you can get spontaneity, but you have to let go of total control. Uh, on the other hand, total control, the danger of total control is exactly the loss of spontaneity. So, um, as, the, as we move forward into film second century, uh, I think all of you filmmakers are going to have to come to terms with this paradigm or some version of this, which is, who am I? What kind of filmmaker am I? And I would put, say, Francis Coppola or Anthony Minghella in the Snowflake area. They, loved the process of making films. They loved to be with other human beings in a dangerous, risky, creative environment. Uh, and they loved thinking up things at the last minute and figuring out a way to put it in the film. They loved other people contributing ideas that they never would have thought of themselves. And that's why the, the metaphor of the snowflake, because that's what happens to a snowflake. A snowflake is created in, in the upper atmosphere. Uh, it solidifies into a solid from water vapor, and it does it in supercooled environments that make it freeze faster than molecules can arrange themselves in perfect hexagonal forms. If you want to see what a water molecule would like to be, just open your refrigerator and look at an ice cube. Uh, ice cube has enough time that water molecules, which are basically hexagons, can fit themselves together in a sort of honeycomb of uh, crystals, uh, water crystals. Uh, when they can't do that, you wind up with something like a snowflake. But so th that mismatch between the speed of freezing and the speed of molecular action, in which freezing is faster than action, produces the great variety of snowflakes. That's why no two snowflakes are the same. Because it's happening all so fast, I can't control it. I'm very spontaneous, but I have had to let go of control. The only thing that manifests itself in a snowflake is the hexagon shape, the six points, uh, which is essential to the water molecule. If we were dealing with another molecule other than water, it would have eight points or four or something else. But with water, it turns out to be six. Uh, but exactly the shape of all of these kind of crustaceans uh, uh, around it uh, are up to, up to chance. And we respond to that as human beings. We love snowflakes. We're not quite so sure about black boxes. Um, so, uh, on the other hand, spontaneity can get out of control, and I've worked on films where that was a problem. So, uh, and no film is 100% one or the other. Um, but every filmmaker is somewhere on that spectrum, and you will have to figure out where you are and where each of the films you work on is in that spectrum, because it, it'll be an always shifting thing. Um, I'm going to make an analogy here, uh, because one of the things, uh, along with uh, dailies, that's under threat is the experience of watching films in theaters. In the old days, meaning 50 years ago, that was the only way, well, maybe a little television, uh, but l l if you turn the clock back to the mid-1930s, if you wanted to see a film, you had to see it in a theater. That was just how it was. It started to fragment with television, and that fragmentation has ramped up to now where it's the famous hockey stick. Uh, there are new ways of looking at films almost every week. Um, I have one in my back pocket. I'm, you have one in your, all of your back pockets. Um, is that good? Uh, what do we lose? What do we gain in experiencing a film uh, seen in a theater? 
And by theater, I mean a theater with lots of other people, like this, 500 people seeing the same thing. Is, now that we no longer technically need to do that, is it a good thing to do? Or, like dailies, is it just going to become a pain that we don't want to do it because it's too expensive and I have to pay the babysitter and I have to drive halfway across town and I'm just going to look at something on Netflix? That may be. But I think, I think, I think there's something in the communal experience that is uh, finally going to resist disappearing completely. Um, my metaphor is uh, this fellow here, which is the, um, the vacuum tube. Uh, this was the heart of all radios and hi-fi systems and computers up until the invention of the transistor in the 1940s, uh, which really started to take over the world in the early 60s. Up to that point, if you wanted to amplify something, you needed one of these. And this was the invention of Lee de Forest, um, and uh, a fantastic invention it is. We no longer use these, but the basic principle of what's going on is in every integrated circuit and transistor. So this is particularly useful uh, because it's analog and it's so visual what's going on. Um, we have a, basically a light bulb that has uh, been all the air sucked out of it. And not, not unsurprisingly, if you plug this in, and this is very schematic, so it's simpler than it really is, if you plug this into the wall, current will go uh, through the first wire, and because of the vacuum, air is an insulator, but if there's a vacuum, the electrons will pile up at the end of that uh, stick, the first terminal, and they'll say, where do we go? And they'll jump, they'll arc, if the, if the distance has been correctly calculated, it'll jump to the other terminal because that's attractive to it, and then they'll continue on their way, and that will come out of a speaker attached to that wire, and you'll get that sound, basically a very unpleasant 60 cycles per second, because that's what's coming out of the wall. It's very powerful. In Europe, I think it's 50. It's very powerful, but it's very stupid. It just says, ba 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 as you just heard. So that's clearly, we don't like to hear that. Uh, so what did Lee DeForest do? He emptied it out again and said, let me introduce a third element here. Uh, I'll hang a wire out the window, and I'll connect that third wire, and this is called a triode because of this third wire, uh, and I'll attach that wire to a screen, a metal screen, in between these two terminals. Now I'm going to put something into that third wire, and I'll put music into it. Uh, there it is. But it's very weak, uh, because let's say it's coming from a radio transmission. It's just a very weak signal uh, that is being picked up by the wire through the fluctuations in the ether, let's say. Um, and uh, it's, but nonetheless, it's energizing that screen extremely weakly. But now we add power. Uh, where, yeah, so that's the energy of the, uh, the, of the music. The screen is dancing, vibrating electrically to the same patterns as the music, but very weakly. It's not enough energy. We couldn't connect up this third wire to the speaker. The speaker has, need, needs more energy to drive that piston in its electromagnet. So the, what Lee DeForest then did is plug the power in, and generate power in the, the first black uh, thing, it would come up and it would make the leap from terminal to terminal through the screen. And here's the key, key, key element, is that when this energy is freed from the shackles of being in a wire, when it's floating in empty space, it is extremely suggestible. It's, whatever's in the environment, it will pick up in mysterious ways, fundamentally, uh, so that it's going through the screen and it picks up the electromagnetic vibrations that are in the screen, which happen to be music, and so when it lands on the other wire and goes on its way, 
it is simultaneously power and coherence. So it's enough power now to drive the speaker, but uh, it's not that sound anymore, it's music. As I said, I've schematized this the hell out of it, but that's the basic idea of a vacuum tube. It's the basic idea of transistors and integrated circuits and all of these things. It's just particularly visual. So where does this go? Well, let's do a little topographic uh, transformation here. So anyway, power and coherence. So you have one wire coherence, another wire power, and the vacuum tube puts them together into power and coherence loud enough so that, or energetic enough so that it can be transformed from electric to acoustic signals, vibrations in the air, and we hear it. So let's do a transformation of that diagram. And now we're looking at a projector and a screen. And the light, just like the light that's coming from that projector onto this screen, is relatively weak. Uh, if, we, if this was daytime and we opened up some windows in this room, I don't think there are any, but if we did that, it would be very hard to see what's on the screen. We have to lower the light in here. This is changing because of, uh, you know, uh, ads that are, uh, you know, animated ads on billboards that you can see during the day. But anyway, the, uh, the equivalent of the signal on the antenna is that beam of light which is greatly coherent. And it takes a long time to make a film. Uh, let's say the average is about two years from starting to write the screenplay to when it's in the theaters. And lots of people work in this process. If you divide uh, two years um, uh, by the number of people who work on a film, you come up with 300 human years of work. So let's say 150 people on average over a two-year period are working on this film, and that means 300 years, which is the equivalent of somebody in 1715 uh, saying, I'm going to make something, it's going to take me 300 years to make it, and at the end of that time, I'm going to show it to you. And you would be very impressed with that. Somebody who worked on something for 300 years, well, but that's what every film is, in a sense. It represents a endless activity of coherence. What does it mean for us as, an edit as editors to say, no, I'm going to cut here rather than there? It's because here is more coherent than there for this film. This makes more sense than that. When a director says, no, I want his shirt to be black, not red, because that's more coherent with his character. When the cameraman says, I'm going to put a 50 millimeter lens on this rather than a 25, that's because this moment is more coherent when it's photographed with a 50 millimeter lens. So, and you multiply that by the 10,000 decisions that every person who works on a film every day has to make, it's all, hopefully, to make the film more itself. It's a growing organism. It's a baby developing in the womb of this process. And everything has to go into the right place so that when the baby is born, it's healthy and uh, it's got all its fingers and toes. Um, so it's weak, this beam of light uh, and the sound that goes with it, but it's extremely coherent. And it's happening in the vacuum of darkness. This room is dark. The only thing we're looking at, if we were watching a movie, that would be the only focus of attention, not anything else in this room. We, we come into the room and we suck all the other things out by turning out the lights so that it's just the focus, your focus is on the screen. And in that environment, just as the electrons are very suggestible, so you, if you have paid your money and you're sitting in the dark, you'd paid the babysitter, you're sitting in the dark, ready to watch the film, you are extremely suggestible. You're saying, show me. I want to be impressed. Uh, I'm ready to experience it. And everybody in the theater has come there for the same reason. As, as hugely varietal as all of these people are, they're all there for the same reason. They want coherence because their lives are not really coherent. Things that are happening seem to be random. 
Uh, you don't like this person. You, your job is frustrating. You know, the weather is bad. I don't like living here. I, on and on and on. And somehow to go to a film and to experience it with other people, and that's the mystery, is that's a reminder of something in the presence of, if it's a good film, of this great coherence uh, which is organized for you uh, to experience this. So there's the audience, uh, and they are tremendously powerful. All of the power of the film comes from the people in the audience. It doesn't come from the film. The film is weak in power, but it's very strong in coherence. The emotional energy for it comes from the audience. And let's say the average uh, age of people in the audience, let's say, is 25. If you do the math, this is, uh, I guess, 600 people, uh, roughly this audience. So the people in this room represent slightly less than 15,000 years of human history, which is already double the entire length of written history of the human beings from 7,500 years ago with the invention of writing to today is only that, and double that amount of human history is here in the room with all of the hopes and dreams, the, uh, the successes, the triumphs, the failures, the disappointments, the love affairs, the deaths, uh, the worries, the hopes uh, that go along with being a human are all collected here and want to be in the presence of something coherent. And so the, the emotion that is felt in a film is powered by you. You are the power, just like that plug that goes into the wall in the vacuum tube. That's what's coming from you. And when it works, which it obviously doesn't always work, uh, you get this power that comes from the audience to the screen and then is kind of reinforced by what's happening on the screen, reinforces that with the audience and makes them more coherent. The, the audience that leaves a good film uh, is more coherent than the audience that came to watch the film. There, a layer of coherence has been deposited on them, hopefully for the best. Uh, but as the film goes on, you get this continuous cycle of energy going, flowing back and forth from the great coherence on the screen to the great power uh, coming from the, the audience. So for these and other reasons, I, I think this is a fundamental part of human beings. Uh, ever since the invention of language, we have been assembling in the dark around the fire to tell stories. And uh, so this has been going on for 100,000 years. Uh, film is the latest iteration of that in human history. The difference is that the flames themselves are telling the story. Uh, we gaze into the moving images and we're looking into the flickering flames of the fire and seeing the story emerge out of that flickering. Uh, but the experience is basically the same. And for that fundamental reason, I don't think it's under threat right now. And it'll be interesting to see where it goes, but I, I don't think it will completely disappear. When I went to film school in 50 years ago, uh, the message from the teachers was, the game is over. Film is gone under the threat of television. It's all going to be atomized. The idea of people going to theaters is... So the first words out of the teacher were, get out now, in 1965. You can still get your tuition back uh, because it's, it's falling apart and there's no job, there's not enough jobs, and it's all going to hell anyway. Um, so, you know... And in fact, about a quarter of the students on that, in that opening uh, uh, orientation class didn't show up the second day. They went into real estate or something else that was um, you know, a more solid occupation. Uh, those of us who stayed, thankfully, were present at a kind of regeneration. In the 70s, people started coming back into the theaters again. Um, and uh, you know, now we're at another point in that, in that cycle. So we're, we're moving from that, and the last thing I wanted to talk about is uh, even more speculative, but it's based on uh, a, an essential neurological truth, which is that hu the human brain, the way it is carried around in each of our heads, uh, it has three operating systems. 
uh, because nature is very conservative. If it's developed something, it doesn't necessarily toss it out when it needs to move to a new level. So the reptile brain, which we all have in the center of our brain, is still with us. We used to be reptiles uh, 300 million years ago. Uh, we still have a reptilian brain in the middle of us. It's called the R complex. And that's represented by the red here. This is very schematic, obviously. Uh, and it has a certain instinctual way of operating. You can feel this brain at work when you are starving. You can feel this brain at work when sexual lust takes over. Uh, you can feel this when somebody is threatening your own life. So these fight or flight, hunger, fear, thirst, starvation, when, when your life is at risk, the reptile brain says, I can take over now. You other guys get out of here. Uh, because your life, the, the person's life now depends on quick, emotionless, instinctual activity. And um, it's just sitting there, and it, you know, kind of surfaces from time to time, even during an ordinary day. Um, you know, when you eat that tenth bag of potato chips, that's the reptile brain uh, at work. Um, wrapped around that is the uh, mammalian brain. Uh, by the way, I should say this is all the theory of Dr. Paul McLean, who was the head neurologist at the National Institute of Mental Health in the United States in the last part of the 20th century. He just died a few years ago. So there is the R complex, the reptilian brain, which is instinct and the brain stem. Wrapped around that, is the limbic system, the mammalian brain, which is emotion. Let's say for the purposes of being schematic, reptiles don't feel emotion the way mammals do. This is because mammals give birth to their young and they care for them and suckle them. The, the very uh, process of giving birth and then suckling uh, the child um, and putting up with this screaming monster that you have given birth to needs you to love that creature. Uh, reptiles basically lay the eggs and say, good luck, guys. Uh, I'm off somewhere. I've given you everything you need. You've got some food. Uh, you've got the equivalent of a college uh, diploma in there. I wish you good luck. Um, and, you know, I hope we don't meet at some later date and you become my dinner. Um, so mammals are different creatures because of this basic uh, function of emotion. Um, and then uh, with human beings is the green cortex uh, around that and our particular uh, skill is language, um, the, the symbolic representation of reality and a concept of interacting with that, a concept of time. So. Uh, McLean said, uh, uh, he, to give a vivid image to this, he said, when you lie down on the psychiatrist's couch, you lie down alongside a crocodile and a horse, meaning a reptile, a mammal, and you. And when we're talking and, and using language, we are using the logic side of our brain, as what I'm saying, making sense. Um, we're also feeling the emotion of it, and uh, the instinct is, is in there somewhere. This uh, is, I would suggest, a particular challenge that film can particularly, is good, particularly good at answering it. And this is one of the reasons I think that film in its larger sense is, has, is the, one of the determining forces, certainly in the 20th century and in the 21st century as well. Because, as I said, we have three operating systems. Films speak simultaneously to all three operating systems. Because of the simple visceral impact of image and sound, it speaks to the reptile in you. You are impacted without having to understand it or even emote about it. It's just it punches you or it caresses you. Uh, so you are having a one-to-one, -one, uh, let's call it visceral relationship with the message that the filmmakers are telling, and if it's a good film, this visceral message is coherent, uh, as in that previous slide, with the emotion that they are trying to convey. 
and uh, the emotion is the, is the powerful engine that uh, makes the film work. How do you feel as you're watching the film? How do you feel when the film is over? If you didn't feel anything or you felt the wrong things, you usually get up and leave the film. Uh, if you don't, at the end of the film, somebody said, how was it? You say, eh, uh, because it didn't touch you emotionally. And then it has to make sense. There, there, and film is full of language. Uh, because it's the spoken word. Um, and that language and the construction of the story has to make intellectual sense. Uh, not in any refined way, but just, what happened? Oh yeah, he said he was in love with her, but he really wasn't because he loved the girl down who worked down at the 7-Eleven. And, you know, he and that girl concocted this plan and they stole the car. Yeah, that makes sense. And then, you know, one thing after another. It, it has to make logical sense for it to work. When we look at history and we look at uh, the distant past uh, with the right kind of binoculars on it, we look at ancient Greece, for instance, when a society is in a good place, it's because everyone in that society is responding to the same myths at these different levels. And that's what the Greek myths are, are stories that in their own way talk to each of these operating systems. The gods are larking about having love affairs with each other and uh, you know, devouring other people and doing all of these crazy things at the reptilian level, but there's also emotion and there's also a strange kind of logic. And if you can get a society to agree on all of that, then you feel that that society and the people in that society feel unified. A society, you know a society is destroyed, and Aristotle even talked about this, when their dreams become incoherent, when the sense they make of the world is divisions and separate things. And, you know, we see this at work today in conflicts between societies and also conflicts specifically in the United States right now between political divisions, between red and blue. Uh, they just are seeing different worlds and they're not agreeing on the myths that underlie that. And film, uh, the challenge of film at the deepest level, and I think the thing that even if we're unaware of it, that we recognize the power of film, is that it can, it has the ability to talk at these levels in a coherent way and hopefully make the society that they are addressing, which might be the world society, to make it a, um, a, a better place. I'm going to leave you with one last thing. Um, this uh, is a, um, it's a, it's a phenomenon that I call the parade effect, and I experienced it uh, back in November when I was fired off of Tomorrowland, and I suddenly found myself from one day working, the next day not, suddenly cut loose, and, but this happens in all circumstances uh, at the end of a project. If you've been working on a film for a year, uh, which is not unusual in editing, um, at the end of the year, the film, you, you, the, it gets more and more intense as you try to meet the deadline, and then suddenly it's over, and now you're uh, not working anymore, you're back home staring at the walls, um, and a very funny feeling uh, comes over you, which nobody explained to me back in 1965. They didn't take me aside and they said, Walter, watch out for the parade effect. So I had to discover this on my own. And you, you've already discovered parts of it. I'm just going to articulate something here that many of you probably already know, which is um, what, I, what I'd like you to do is look at this circle, and I'm going to animate it now, <clears throat> stare at the center of the circle, and then when the animation stops, look at the pattern that is, uh, comes on screen. So this will last about 20 seconds. Just stare at the center of the circle. Can you see the bulge happening? And it goes away. It, it lasts for a few seconds. What that's called is a neurological accommodation. 
If you stare at something like that for a period of time, all of the signals are going in a certain direction, and your, the, the neurological processing that's going on accommodates itself to this new normal. It, it has to be long enough for this to take effect. So it says, oh, this is normal. And then when it's suddenly removed, things go in the opposite direction. And this is also called the waterfall effect because you can do it with a waterfall. If you stand next to a waterfall, stare at the waterfall for a minute, and then turn and stare at the rock over here, the rock will seem to be flowing in the opposite direction. And I experienced, the reason I call it the parade effect is that I uh, experienced this watching the Macy's Day Parade in New York in the 1940s. Uh, and I would, my mother would take me and I'd run through the crowd and sit as close as possible uh, at the edge of the crowd and watch the parade go by for an hour. And then the best part, when the last balloon had gone off, I would look down at the asphalt of Fifth Avenue and I would see it flowing in the opposite direction. And at first I didn't know what the hell was happening. It's like, what's that? It's oozing. Well, if it's oozing there, it must be coming from there. So I'd look over there, but that would be oozing too. And then where's it going? It's going there, but that would be oozing. And then eventually it would go away. And then I thought, well, th th in, in a five-year-old way, I thought, this is an illusion. This is happening here, not there. Um, and it happens to us at the end of a film because of this coherence issue that I'm talking about. When we think about working on a film, we're like this little red guy there, and the film is a mountain that we're climbing. And we imagine that uh, at some point, at the middle of November, this film has to be done. And we imagine that as the top of the mountain. And uh, every day you go another few steps up the mountain and you think, someday I will be done with this film and I, it'll be great, I'll be at the top of the mountain. And, but because of the accommodation effect, uh, this isn't actually, after a while, this isn't how it feels. It feels more, well, I mean, yeah, this is what we imagine is going to happen. So you go up the mountain and then, whoopee, at the end you stand on top of the mountain and everything's great. But really what happens is this, that things that are, if, if you literally climbed a mountain every day for a year, your brain would say, to hell with this vertical stuff, it's basically horizontal. And this is, this is what happens when you know, people in experiments are fitted with glasses that turn the world upside down. After a day or two, the brain says, oh, this is the new normal, then I'll flip it back the other way. So even though the signal is coming in, being turned upside down by the glasses, the brain turns it back the other way. So the same thing happens here. A slope, if it's pursued endlessly over a long period of time, every day, you, this becomes the new normal, and normal is horizontal. The problem is that the angle doesn't change. So at the end, the angle of completion uh, of this, this, this angled slope to the horizontal uh, is tilted, so that we now are moving forward in time, and when we reach the end, uh, you go into outer space, <laughs> and then you try to regain your footing. And, but now there's a very mixed message, because I know that I'm standing, uh, intellectually, I know I'm standing on a horizontal surface, but the world feels crazy. Um, this is linked up with this idea of coherence, because what we as editors do every day, and hundreds or thousands of times a day, is make the film more coherent. This take, not that. Let's cut here, not there. Let's do this dissolve that's this long, not that long. No, let's not do a dissolve. Let's do a, a swirly wipe. Let's split the screen here. Let's blow it up. Let's uh, slow the action down. Let's on and on and on. Why? Well, because we're making the film more coherent to itself. And we're discovering this coherence as it happens. It, it is... Um, it's, it's a simultaneous process of creation and discovery, which is what makes filmmaking so exciting. The problem comes if, if you're like that uh, uh, bullseye thing, if you're experiencing the world getting more and more coherent, things coming from outside and finding their place in the film. Here's a new shot. 
Let's put it in the film. Here's a new visual effect. Let's put it in the film. Here's a new sound effect. Let's put it in the film. Here, not there. With this EQ, not that EQ. Let's slow it down and speed it up. Uh, coherent, coherent, coherent. When you stop, the opposite happens. And like that image of the bulge, the world now, instead of becoming more coherent, the world seems to be becoming less coherent. And if you read the news every day, you're going to find lots of fodder for this lack of coherence. And it can be sickening. It feels uh, roughly the equivalent of a kind of seasickness. What's happening to me? What's happening to the world? And what you have to learn, like accommodating yourself to seasickness, is that this is simply a stage in the process and nothing will make it go away other than time. And it will go away and then you'll be ready to do another film. But it, you know, can last 10 days, it can last two weeks, it can last six weeks. Uh, under bad circumstances, it can last even longer. And, and it's not unique to film. This is PTSD. This is soldiers coming back from combat to ordinary existence. And it's disorienting. And you have to find ways to accommodate yourself to it. Otherwise, uh, if you don't, you slip off into this other world, uh, which we never want to go to. And here comes the Janus fellow again, so I'm going to bid you adieu. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you.